Greetings, everyone. Happy November. It is good to see you, and I am thrilled to announce, as fun as it was to see Zach Cass, who is in Dubai, our speaker tonight, is here in person. Um, I am also equally thrilled to introduce Arden, who's going to be introducing our speaker. He has uh, what I consider a super interesting background and is getting his design certificate uh, from Jacobs and is also in uh, data uh, analysis. Um, one thing that is really lovely is, I don't know if you remember, but in the beginning of the year, we had everybody signing up for speaker slots. And so that happens in the beginning, but kind of drops off. But from the beginning, Arden was um, totally set on introducing Matt. Uh, and so it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Arden to introduce Matt. Oh, and why don't we you take a microphone? Come on in the middle. Okay. I know. Here. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Arden, um, um, and I'm a, I'm a junior majoring in cognitive science with a minor in data science. I'm thrilled to introduce you to Matthew Carlson, a Cal alum and the director of user experience design at Adobe. Matt has a Matt has played a crucial role in shaping user experiences for major tech giants like Facebook, Twitter, and currently Adobe. Matt's experience in the startup world gives him a unique pers perspective that he will be sharing with us tonight. He will be talking about the various stages of the startup experiences from the early days to the present day. He will be sharing insights from his time at some of the most successful startups in the world. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Matt Carlson to the stage. Hey everybody. Is my mic on? Yep. OK, great. Um, so one thing that Victoria told me before coming here is that I should have less slides and more stories. But I'm a designer, so I have more slides and also more stories. That's just the way it works. OK. Here we go. I am, my name is Matt Carlson. I'm the director of UX design at Adobe. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. My appearance is I'm a 53-year-old white person, lots of smile lines, mostly gray hair, uh, blue eyes, dark brown glasses, which hold on, I'll just put these on, and a black shirt. OK. My mental age is mostly 53, sometimes 13. My personal motto is suspend disbelief. I use this every time that someone says, we tried that, it didn't work, or, um, or people will never shop on their phones, or AI will never create art. This is um, when I usually trot out suspend disbelief. Here's a cartoon version of myself. This is easier to draw. You'll see it lots in the presentation. But I am thrilled, thrilled to be here. I'm a Cal Bear, class of 93. I love engineers and entrepreneurs, and you all know what you want to do after Cal, I imagine, maybe more than I did. I had no idea what I wanted to do after Cal. But today's theme is design. I'm a designer is going to be the first part. Design is your friend will be the second part. And then the third part, we're going to talk about design your future, some lenses or frameworks that you could think of if you want to um, design sort of lasting, innovative ideas. But a little background first, I am from the before time. I know what modems sound like. I'm not going to read this out loud. I was in jazz choir, but I'm also not going to sing it. But um, modems sounded like chaos when you listen to them, if any of you were, have heard any recordings. Uh, and if you listen to them for too long, it might drive you insane. But kind of like a, um, that sort of sums it up. My first gaming console was an Atari. That's what games used to look like. It had one button, one button. My playlists were on cassette tapes that we had to record off of the radio, and radio had commercials. Makes me shake my head. My first computer programs were also on cassette tapes. It was basically a cassette tape-based civilization back then, but that's what the computer lab looked like. Put in your cassette tape, program your little basic C program, um, hit record. This is what the before times looked like. It's Seattle, circa 1970. That's Seattle before Amazon, before Microsoft, before um, Starbucks. So it's basically lumber, fish, and seasonal depression. But I escaped to Cal, the most important part, in 1988. Here's my Berkeley map. So uh, let's see. It starts in um, Unit 3, Norton. I remembered that. 
uh, it would go to the boathouse for the rowing team early morning, 5 a.m. And then after that, it was the art and practice building and followed by Dwinell Hall, um, sometimes stopping at Strada on the way home or studying at Cafe Milano at night, spending all my money at Amoeba or Inkstone or Top Dog, and then pouring beers at rallies. So in no particular order. Luckily, most of these things are still here, except all the burrito places that I used to go to are not still here. Here's Berkeley by the numbers. I probably drank about 948 cappuccinos at Strada and Milano. I probably served somewhere in the range of 1,300 pints at rallies. And my first design job was $8 an hour making all the chalkboards for microbrews, um, once again at rallies. Unfortunately, all my works of art burnt down um, somewhere in the last 10 years. Here's the biggest number. This is the 0, 0.0 that I got the first semester of my sophomore year. That was when I thought I was going to go pre-med. It turns out that math, calculus, and chemistry are really important for doctors, and I was absolutely terrible at all of those, um, even to the point of one TA going like, oh, you're still in this class? Yes, I'm still in this class. Somehow I survived the 0, 0.0, and, um, and I, it was time for a really big pivot, so I became an art major. An art major was okay, but I was broke. And so being an art major sort of filled me with despair because I couldn't afford the paints and all my teachers were going like, lay on more paint, put more paint on the canvas. You really need to lay on the paint. Uh, so couldn't do that. That was sort of unsustainable. So I became a broke English major. Ka-ching, big money job. That is the major that gets you the big bucks after school, if any of you want to know. Um, I finished out my Berkeley experience as an English major and I graduated with absolutely no idea what I was going to do next. So naturally, I went into advertising. I went home to Seattle. I worked at a, um, I got an internship at a very small ad agency. And that was the first time when I was there as an assistant account executive. Um, that was when I first saw someone playing in the corner with a really big monitor, playing with type and color and images and moving them around. And I'm like, hey, what is that? And he's like, I'm a graphic designer. So then I found out what I really wanted to do. I really wanted to be a designer. And I, first thing I did, I came back to design school in San Francisco, and I started kind of taking some really, um, learning everything I could about graphic design, typography, layout, imagery, taking all the design classes. And then the um, second I got my first real design job, I dropped out. Here's my first design job. If you've ever grabbed a Sunday paper and shaken it, and all these coupons come out for buying a pint of ice cream or rice a or whatever it might be, that was my job. I was designing coupons that fall out of your Sunday paper. And there were eight designers and one computer. So we would all hand draw all the type for all the ads and then hand it over to the one designer who was rated to work on the computer. And that person would lay out the ads. And um, it's OK to say that you know, sometimes your first job might really, really suck. But here's the good thing. Your first job is not your last job. Oh, one last quote from that job. Uh, me going into the boss saying, like, hey, we should really make a website for the internet to show off the studio's portfolio. And having the boss say, and this was 1994, the internet, that will blow over. Um, spoiler alert, it didn't blow over. OK, here's my curvilinear career path. Not straight at all. I worked at a small ad agency. I worked at, oh, I named the studio that was. I worked at a, a studio that was doing kind of packaging and coupons and stuff like that. And then I went to work at a place called Clement Mock Designs. And this was one of the first um, design studios that was actually creating websites. So it was really exciting. There were probably about six studios in San Francisco that realized the web was a thing. So that's where I got some of my early training, information architecture and graphic design and interactive design. <clears throat> and after that, I went to go work a for a tiny branding boutique called Brand A Studio. That got gobbled up into a bigger company, a big web development shop called Phoenix Pop. This was in, around the dot-com era when um, there were like three startups, South of Market and San Francisco, selling dog food online. That was an example of like the hype that was going on right then. It turned out that all that hype and the dot-com boom was unsustainable. That led quickly to the dot-com crash. I went and started my own studio, a really tiny design studio called Department 3. That was focused on interactive and branding, and we thought a three-person shop. We never grew beyond three people at Department 3, so be careful how you name your companies in the future. Um, after that, I went and worked at an industrial design company called One & Co that made snowboard boots and really great um, sneakers and 
glasses and um, cool phones. Everyone from that studio um, has since gone on to work at Google. Um, the founder went and launched Heath Ceramics in Sausalito, but they all went basically, um, most of them went tech. Then I moved back east for six years and I worked at a place called Design Continuum, another industrial design studio with a super awesome shop filled with engineers and product developers and strategists who were really focused on making physical products. Things like um, a laptop, they made a thing called One Laptop for Child that was focused on making, um, a kind of democratizing reach to technology. They also made the Target uh, shopping cart. Huh? That name is familiar. Yes. Um, and uh, after being in Boston for six years, we realized, my wife and I realized that we were West Coast people. We came back and I started working at a company called Hot Studio. Hot Studio was one of the first studios in San Francisco that was really focused on making iPad apps. This was around the time that the iPad was launching. Um, and Hot Studio also started working for Facebook and they did such a good job of unblocking Facebook's engineers that Facebook acquired them. So that brought me into Facebook. And I worked at Facebook for about a year and a half, primarily on ads products, and I um, can go into greater detail about that um, in a little bit in the presentation. But I was there for about um, you know, one and a half years, kind of felt like Facebook wasn't quite the vibe that, um, that you know, it was just a little bit too calm there, so I went to go work at Twitter. And Twitter was really like a, a zombie attack on a rocket ship that's hurtling towards Earth at all times, but it was really fun. The nice thing about Twitter was um, everyone there really cared about them. Oh, and by the way, I'll be super clear. This is pre-Musk Twitter. So this is Twitter in sort of a brief golden age um, before everything melted into the lava. I was at Twitter for three and a half years, once again, working on business products there. And after that, I, um, as it was like, um, I was kind of realizing maybe I didn't want to work in the ad space anymore. I really wanted to kind of get back to my roots and get back to creativity. I was lucky enough to start a role at Adobe. But here's a couple of other takeaways really quick. Um, if you join a company, and if during orientation they give you matching hoodies and a tiny red book of you know, special sayings, and they give you all the Red Bull and all the Nutella that you demand, and they encourage you to never ever leave campus, you may have joined a... Okay, you said it, I didn't say it, but you, 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 know, you got it. Um, it was an interesting place to make, but it was also sort of like, you know, tech Disneyland. Here's a Twitter takeaway. Twitter's slogan was love where you work. And you can love where you work, but just don't strap your company to a rock and wait for a savior because that savior might be way worse than you expected, even though everyone thought, how bad could it really be? Turns out it could be really, really, really bad. All of us Twitter alum are like watching from the sidelines as like it gets actively dismantled. So, you know, it goes from this is fine to, yeah, this is X. Now Adobe Life. This is where I've been longer than any other job in my career. Uh, I work at Adobe because my personal values are deeply aligned with the company value, which is creativity for all. And you know, I get to, um, you know, I, in this way I'm kind of like, I am my customer to a certain extent. I'm able to work on things that I'm deeply passionate about and I'll tell you what those are. So at Adobe, the three teams that I manage are education, fresco, and fonts. And with education, we're focused on what are all the ways that we can bring the ability to design stuff, the ability to learn creative tools, to you know, do creative projects. We are looking at how do we bring that to kids, both K through 12 and higher ed. So some of you may have used Adobe's tools, Express, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, depending upon what you're working on. Um, my team is really focused on how do we make these tools accessible for the next generation? How do we make creativity accessible for the broadest range of people possible? I also have the drawing and painting apps. So drawing is a passion of mine, and, um, and if you haven't heard of Fresco, please, and if you have an iPad, please go get um, Fresco and try it out. It's a really fun app that is, like, creates like, beautiful, beautiful illustrations, and it's just very fun to play with. And then fonts. You may not know it, but you're probably using fonts this very moment on your phone and your papers and everything you do. And Adobe has more fonts than you can possibly count or use and some really, really delicious, beautiful ones. I've always loved fonts ever since um, I started in design school. And so being at the place where I get to play with these is like total kid in the candy store, if it's a font candy store. But I also have a lot of extracurriculars. I have a lot of hobbies. And may I just like, you know, recommend to all of you Whatever your hobbies are now, whatever passions you have, definitely hold on to them because it's interesting how they might influence your future career. 
I love to draw type. I mentioned fonts. I love to draw lettering. I love to draw type. I love to draw fantasy stuff and geek out. This is back to the kind of the 13-year-old version of me. <clears throat> I love to draw robots and think of future things, which we'll see some of that later in the presentation. And I end up doing a lot of posters because for whatever reason, I seem to be the, like the main graphic designer at all these tech companies that I go to. So I often end up doing posters for teams and posters for clubs and posters that just, you know, um, for fun. I do labels on the side. This helped me kind of like, you know, keep some, uh, these are for friends. I don't do it for anyone, but you know. Um, and it's nice to have friends who are winemakers because they pay in wine. And I design games for kids. So I have a lot of things that I kind of like do in my extracurricular life just to kind of keep my passions flowing. And um, this game is called Wander Squares, by the way. I also experimented, it was part of a Kickstarter that I ran that somehow I pulled off, but I, um, I can share some more links to that if anyone is interested in role-playing games or um, stuff like that. Wander Squares. It's like D&D, but fun. So basically, you know, all of that, you know, that setup there um, jumps me to part two. I'm a designer. I, if I had to like define myself, like what do I do? You know, what are the things that I that um, that kind of central to how I define myself? It's through, you know, I basically describe myself as a designer. And my working definition of design is pretty straightforward. Um, I don't think design is um, it's not rocket science. It's not what you do. It is something that is you know, possible for many people to pick up and many people to use. You don't have to be a designer to design stuff. It's basically just creative problem solving with some meaningful, well-structured outputs. And by meaningful, here's what I mean. Helping people to meet their wants and needs, to accomplish their goals, and fulfill their dreams. My superpower, I know lots of designers who are way better designers than who I am. Better logo designers, better interactive designers, um, you know, better in many different ways. My specific superpower is driving innovation. And when I say driving innovation, what that means is working in big crowded rooms with people who have different ideas about the way a product strategy should go and helping them to align. And then hopefully generate some new ideas for different products or features that they could develop. So I'm really good at, at listening, facilitating, drawing out ideas, and capturing them all in a way that everyone can remember what that workshop was about. And but, by the way, um, COVID was heartbreaking for me because I do my best work on a whiteboard, and suddenly I had to like, start using other tools. So if you have to like, do remote work with a remote team, Moreau is pretty good. I would like, recommend that. But um, I just got back to the whiteboard. This is from last week when I was running a product strategy session with my team and like, I'm back, I'm back. Just smell the markers. Okay. Um, I'm gonna run through some projects that I worked on and talk about you know, what I did on them, and um, then we'll talk about the next section, which is gonna look at some how we might design products for the future. But one thing that I've always done is, I've always found myself, whether I'm working for a big company or a small company or a startup, it's almost always been launching some new product, some new feature, or pulling off some type of event that is a little bit unexpected. So one of those things was very early in my career, I got sucked into doing the Casper versus Deep Blue website. We were working with IBM. I was at a tiny web studio at the time called Clement Mock Designs. So here I was while this three match website was going on between Gary Kasparov, I think he was the world champion at the time, the grand wizard, whatever, um, and an IBM supercomputer, Deep Blue. And we were, I was 20 floors beneath in this moldy dungeon with really old computers and we were following the match move by move and every time there would, there would be a move we would update the chessboard and publish it out to the internet, which is like no big deal now, but back in 96, that was kind of like a big deal that we were able to like get this whole thing published and let the whole world follow what was a pretty um, groundbreaking and crazy to watch uh, chess match. And really quickly, what made it crazy was watching Gary Kasparov, who had a really serious glower. That guy could work a stare like no one else. So try and stare down the, um, the deep blue handler, which was a human being moving the chess pieces. And the computer screen that you see there, that was telling the human what to do. Gary would stare at the handler for like 15 minutes, make a move. And then the handler would go, Tuk! and Gary would stare at the handler for 15 minutes and make a move. And then the computer handler would go, Tuk! and move that piece back. So it was like 15 minutes, 10 seconds. 15 minutes, 10 seconds. And I think Gary won the first match, lost the second, too. 
if I remember right, because like, you know, he couldn't quite stare, <laughs> like it just had no effect on the guy who was moving the pieces, but pretty fascinating to watch from like 20 floors down. We were in a room called the Green Room, which was actually green just because it was seriously moldy. Here's another project, Rethinking Harvard Business Review. I tended, for whatever reason, to end up doing a lot of bit of magazine work. So this was at a place called Design Continuum when I was back east. This was one of the sort of non-physical products that they um, worked on. This was working with the Harvard Business Review team to rethink their magazine for a way that would fit the modern reader and sort of basically chop up their long case studies into short, tasty bites that would make it easier to consume. This was another very kind of strange and fast-moving project. This was the Zinio app for the launch of the iPad. And what this was was an interactive magazine reader that launched when the iPad launched. And from the kickoff to when they actually had a physical product launching when the iPad launched, it was a six week time frame. The strange thing about this is we never saw an iPad during that whole time. We were basically given a piece of cardboard that was iPad shaped and told to like, you know, imagine. One rep from Apple said, you should really try and use as many complex gestures as possible. This iPad is capable of you know, registering and moving with 11 touches. So that's, okay, let's hold down. One, two, three, four, five. okay, 10 fingers, and I never know, like, what is the 11th touch on the iPad? Is the person going to be putting their nose on it? I'm not sure what that was going to be. Um, but we had to come up with this magazine reader, a fully functioning magazine reader. We launched with about, um, I think, 48 titles at launch, and the articles did interesting kind of Harry Potter-esque things. They moved, they had interactivity. You could click and go to a website from them, and we figured out how to basically pull that off within a six-week time frame. How we did it was the designers and the engineers working really closely together on a big whiteboard, and the de designers saying, here's what we want, and the engineers going like, you know, another circle far away going like, well, here's what we can actually do, and gradually working those two circles close, closer together until we were able to come up with a meaningful compromise of what we could launch with. Pretty shortly after that, I helped define a product strategy for 17 and Mary Claire on the iPad, and I know, I know, you're looking at me and you're going, he's really more of a Cosmo or Vogue reader, but no, um, this was a, another experience of just like really immersing ourselves, working closely with the editor teams, uh, editorial teams of both Seventeen and Mary Claire, and understanding what their readers wanted, what they wanted, and what they wanted to do with their the, when they launched interactive magazines, and defining some product strategies that would fit that. So do, being able to like shop the shoot, um, you know, look at a photo shoot and actually you know purchase the things on that interactively right there on your iPad video tutorials, um, the quizzes became really fun. Basically, how do we bring interactivity into this static, um, very fun magazines, but how would we kind of liven them up through interactivity? This is Intel Storyplay. This is a moment when Intel was trying to like really move into developing more consumer applications or consumer software, and they really wanted to reach out and see if they could kind of reach to a kid's market. So their brief here was like, uh, we want something that's kind of like PowerPoint, but for kids, because like, if there's one thing that kids really, really want, it's to use PowerPoint. That's my laugh line. Um, of course, kids don't want to use PowerPoint. So, but we wanted, what we did instead was create a web-based storytelling platform that would let kids kind of like mix and match and be the hero of their own story, put in backgrounds, put in artwork, bring in things that could um, help them in, you know, tell lots of interesting stories. Now, this is the sexy stuff. Um, not everything I do is consumer facing. Sometimes I do things that are, and by sexy, I'm being completely sarcastic. This was stepping into, one of the things I worked on at Facebook was redefining an object model for Facebook ads that would work for all the different types of advertisers that they needed to reach. So small businesses, big businesses, ad agencies, and everything in between. And when we came into Facebook, they had tons of different models and a whole ecosystem of third party companies that helped um, advertisers to make sense of Facebook. So instead we said, hey, we should make sense of our own, um, our own product. And we stepped in and created a, an expandable object model for ads that would support all the different types of um, things that they needed to, to make. So sometimes like, you know, once again, I think the one really fun part of working there was working really closely with engineers and product managers to compromise and come up with a meaningful product for Facebook's clients. Another thing that I did there was, you know, storytelling is really central, and especially in Facebook or Twitter or Adobe, where often many of the products that we work on are very abstract. So 
storytelling and visual storytelling is really crucial to figure out how we take these abstract things and, and begin to humanize them and tell them in human ways. So here I worked with an illustrator to create a visual language for Facebook that let them easily begin to tell the stories of the things they wanted to sell, the environments that, that their clients were working in. And we used these to create kind of like visual explainers that did a much better job of conveying or communicating what Facebook's core business was about. <coughs> At Twitter, you know, jumping to the, the Twitter years, one of the more interesting things that we did there was look at how we could use DMs, which were very kind of robust and popular within Twitter back in the golden days again, uh, and use those as a means to sell sneakers, sell Starbucks, let people begin to you know, engage in e-commerce and engage directly with companies through the Twitter DMs. And now, you know, I think like digital commerce, especially on our phones, is so widespread that, um, that this seems like kind of like, oh, of course you could do that. But back at the time, it was really pushing the limits of what people might do on their phones and do on Twitter. One of the things that I'm working on right now that I'm ex you know, very excited about is um, drawing and painting tools within Adobe Express. So Adobe Express is more of our mass market or education focused product. And one of the most important things about it is it is designed to work really well in Chromebooks which means that there is access to these creative tools on the laptop of choice for most US schools, which means that we are broadening the access to the ability to design stuff, visualize stuff, draw color to the, anyone who has a Chromebook. And so this is a, um, just a quick snapshot of a, of a, it's also very soothing to color on some of these things if you ever have a break in your classes. So you know, what we just did was like launch the new drawing and painting and coloring tools within Adobe Express. And of course, on top of all those products that I've worked on, there's been lots and lots of logos along the way. Some of them have been successful and some that have totally failed, like that AIM one, which I think is really pretty lovely. And you know, a nice update on that little yellow man, if any of you remember AIM or AOL. But um, you know, it lasted for about six months. Uh, I also have done a fair share of logos for all of my friends who I went to Berkeley with. So if you're an engineer or an entrepreneur or a product manager, Befriend the designers in the room because someday you will get free logos out of it. Next section, design is your friend. I'm gonna talk briefly around the way that design and product managers and engineers work in some bigger companies. So here's what designers are really good at and I guarantee you most of you will probably have designers in your future. We're really good at telling stories, at designing experiences, at mapping out journeys, at scripting interactions, and imagining, poss imagining possibilities. So what we're, we're good at is we're good at, at taking big, bold ideas that are so powerful and so moving, like you know, you know, here might be an engineer or an entrepreneur creating like the ultimate coffee machine, something that could create like the like molecular coffee that is the best tasting, most delicious coffee in the world. So you come up with this massive, you know, the, like the best possible way ever. What a designer is good at is taking that and bringing it down to a human scale so that someone else can appreciate and understand the innovation that you're bringing them. So you know, here we go from like the, the coffee, you know, coffinatrix to something that is like much more human, achievable, small. Designers will help keep you grounded and bring some of the, like the big bold ideas down to earth so that other people can actually experience them. When I, in most companies, this is kind of the breakdown. Um, engineers will really explore and bring what's possible. What can you do with technology? What is possible within the frameworks that we have? They will, they will push and expand and consider like, you know, what are all the things that um, you might be able to do within, the, um, within code, within all of the technology that companies have. Designers will take a look at, okay, out of that, what's meaningful? And that overlap between what's possible and what, what's meaningful is really powerful. And it can often lead to like real product breakthroughs. And then it is crucial to have a product manager because then they'll go, what's probable and also shippable? out of what's possible and meaningful and, you know, and those two things work together. So those three overlapping in, in high functioning teams, the engineer, designers, and product managers work really closely together. And it kind of feels like a, like a molecule, you know, with engineer, design, and product at the center of it. And then they're drawing in research insights at, at both Facebook, Twitter, and Adobe. There's usually researchers who are bringing fresh insights to the table and helping um, that core of, of EDP, really understand what people want, what they need, 
um, both in a generative way before you start a project and also in an evaluative way after, you've, after you're developing product. It's really great to be able to see, like, how is this working out? How do people experience this? Is this, a, um, is this the right feature set that we want? And oh, by the way, I'll just let everyone know that um, I'm also going to give you guys this whole presentation. I've actually posted it online. I'm not going to tell you where until after the presentation, but everything's posted here. So if you don't want to take notes and just watch, you totally can. Um, anyhow, surrounding it, we got researchers, we have content strategists, and then holding everything together. You know, all these companies have a role called um, program managers. And these are the people who are managing internal stakeholders, who know who you need to meet and when, who will run the gamut and gauntlet of all the different things you need to do to be able to launch a product. And then product marketing managers are the ones who will help to kind of figure out what story do we need to craft and tell externally. And then you know, think of each one of those as a little pod. Maybe each pod is in charge of a product or a feature. But then you have all the different functions talking to each other, designer to designer, um, engineer to engineer, product to product, and helping to kind of act as this sort of secondary nervous system that helps to make sure that all the different pods are coordinated. And a little bit about designers. If you leave designers alone, you might come back and find out that they've built a design system that helps all the different parts uh, and products and features begin to fit together. And if you don't know what a design system is, it's usually kind of an articulation of all the button styles, typography, color, UI elements that your product needs to function. And they'll build that into like a big library that they share designer to designer and engineer to engineer that actually kind of speeds up development and helps the entire product feel more cohesive. So some examples of that might be material design from Google or the human interface guidelines, the HIG from Apple or Spectrum, which is Adobe's design system. Here's some things that you might end up doing with your designers. You might work out a brand positioning. This is working out the kind of the repositioning of AIM from AOL with another Kyle grad, Mike Mazur, um, who happened to be working at AOL at the time. So there you're looking at, you know, who is this for? Um, you know, what is it? What will it serve? How is it differentiated from other brands or products? You might also work with a designer to develop personas, the core users that are going to um, be using your product or feature. So often we go through like, what do they need? What do they want? What do they dream about? You know, and really try and capture that from a mix of research insights and the data that we have to develop a rich picture about um, the, the users who are going to use the product. You might work with your designers to brainstorm new products. So after you've thought about your business and you thought about the people who you're designing for, you might work with them to figure out like, what are new products or features that we could use to differentiate, innovate, or disrupt. And you'll map customer journeys, where you're looking at the end-to-end -end flow from where someone discovers your product to where they're its biggest fan. What are all the steps in between and all the choices they need to make? So those are just some of the things you might do with um, the designers that you're going to work with in the future. But if you're lucky, you'll find a partner who likes to innovate just as much as you do, um, who likes to innovate as much as they create, and so that together you can design the future. So for this next section, I just wanted to take a moment and I was thinking really deeply about what can I bring to you um, the kind of like the future of uh, technology, the future of innovation. What could I bring to you that might be meaningful? So what I did was I took a moment and I created a couple lenses or frameworks that might help you when you're thinking about your next big idea. I wanted to give you some ways to reframe it, rethink it to kind of like, you know, um, maybe spark a little bit more innovation, help your ideas that you're coming up with, because I bet there's some startup future people here to help your ideas be more future friendly. So here's a quote, you've probably heard it before, but the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. This is from William Gibson, one of those cyberpunk authors that, well, they were cyberpunk authors back in the 90s, but now most of them are futurists at major institutions. And a lot of the stuff that they predicted back then um, came true and you're actually soaking in it right now. So, you know, read your sci-fi, everyone. But yes, in case you're wondering, we're in the future right now. You all have supercomputers in your pocket. They're connected to cloud-based networks. We are post a global pandemic that changed the way that we all live and work. Uh, AI has seriously risen. Chat GPT can write papers, I dare say, as good as many of you, certainly as good as me. Um, Mid-journey just popped last summer, and suddenly every designer and artist was looking at something that could create art and design to a level that previously hadn't been seen. Dolly hadn't quite hit it before. Mid-journey like, really broke through. And so uh, a couple other things. There was blockchain, which is, you know, 
Um, drones are in are being used for like so many different things uh, across all different areas of, of commerce and society. We are working from home. Happened in a real way. I think every big tech company was surprised that they could still pull off their job while working from home. Um, Disney, they made movies and animated stuff working from home. Adobe, Facebook, all these companies were able to still get their job done, keep their products up while from their apartments, from their houses, from abroad. It's been a really interesting time. Uh, there's biometric scanning in all sorts of the ways, whether you look at your phone or you're doing it on your way through the airport. That's just become widespread, so Minority Report is kind of on full effect. Space travel, asterisk, you know, not totally stable yet. Um, Self-driving cars, a little bit of pause on those. But, you know, this innovation happens in cycles. So things happen, they fail a little bit, they happen again. So I'm sure we'll see all those things moving forward. So what I wanted to do is show a couple lenses that will help you take your ideas and maybe think about them in future-friendly ways. So first, build a time machine. Start with the now. Start with this moment and kind of map back. Look at all the things in your life, the way that you are, um, the way that you work, the way you do schoolwork, the way that you buy stuff, the way that you consume media, the way that you travel, um, all these things. Kind of map out all the different aspects of your life and consider just how much they've changed in the last five years. And it's been a remarkable amount of change and acceleration that has just happened. So take those trends um, that just affected everything you had like, and start, um, take them and begin to push them forward. Like, what are they gonna be like four years from now, 10 years from now? Take the trends and the amount of acceleration that you're seeing right now and unlock your brain and consider like, what would it be if you have, like, if these same things keep on moving forward? If your phones keep getting smarter, if AI keeps becoming more of a pervasive part of our, your life, and you have it within yourselves. If you're giving yourself enough time and a little bit of like, you know, loading up your brain, you can begin to envision what the future might look like. And the future won't look like this. I mean, the sneakiest thing about innovation and the sneakiest thing about the future is we're still wearing normal clothes. We're not dressed in tinfoil wearing funny hats. You know, it feels a little bit like the past. We're still wearing shoes on our feet. Everything feels like, you know, the future hasn't quite announced itself, but it's seeping in all around you. So, you know, and by the way, the, the time machine here is actually just your brain. It's just a matter of like, look at the rate of change that things have happened and begin to imagine like, okay, what if? And I'll have a couple more tools for talking about what if in a moment. So meet your future customers. Here's a big uh, surprise. Your future customers will probably look a lot like you. They are going to have known the internet since birth. They will be tech savvy. They are probably going to understand touch UI and gestural UI. You know, I think the latest Apple ad had people snapping their fingers to make their watch um, stop doing something. They're going to be socially networked. Anyone here use you know, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, anything? Can I get a show of hands? Anyone on any? So, okay. So you guys all have that as sort of an established part of your universe. Uh, you will probably, in a year or two, be AF, AI fluent. You'll probably be using AI in lots of ways. And four years from now, you'll probably be acting almost like a symphony composer, manipulating lots of AI things around you and having them perform actions on your behalf. So you will very likely be one of the, the first AI fluent generations. And then the youngsters that are behind you, um, and I can't remember what the gen name is for them, is it back to alpha again? I'm not sure. Um, they will grow up with AI as something that they are just accustomed to, the same way that you are accustomed to all those other things. Um, Anyone here ever use Minecraft? Okay, so that's another thing. Both my kids, both teens, used Minecraft a lot growing up in school. Um, you guys are another generation that is probably very comfortable manipulating 3D objects in a 3D space and don't even think twice about it. So imagine that how that might play out into more of an AR VR future that is probably com coming up. You guys are going to be ready for it. I don't know, like, what will, the, um, what will be next? What will be the next big breakthrough that might pull together all those things and be even more transformative? That will be your future customer. It's gonna be you plus something really weird that you didn't expect. I think it's fun to imagine future jobs. And I came up with these things, but then some of these future jobs are actually present jobs right now. But what, one future job might be an AI empathy coach that's helping AI to really understand human beings so that it can make um, thoughtful recommendations, even more thoughtful recommendations than it's making right now. So create, um, write more thoughtfully, understand people better, do a better job of understanding what people's needs are. That's very likely, actually, that probably isn't even a future job, that's probably a today job. 
There are people who are working on, on making AI more empathetic. There are, um, there are people who are working on AI speak more fluently. This is kind of like, that's right on the edge. Their um, future job, you might be a nanobot herder working on some tiny biological robots and helping to gradually herd them toward, towards completing some complex task, whether that is an operation on someone, whether that is fixing a circuit somewhere, whether that is moving beneath a farm and, and you know, working on the soil. Once again, actually, that's probably not a future job. There's probably someone who has that job right now. They just haven't described it as such. Or maybe you're a metaverse farmer where you're creating artful, bespoke, organic, um, new, organic, not really organic, digital worlds for different clients or customers because the metaverse is going to be expanding at a big clip. And if you have ever seen Ready Player One, there's a lot of worlds that need to be built before that thing happens. Or maybe, here's another thing. Let's think of what's gonna be in your go bag uh, you know, four years from now. What are gonna be your go-to moments that you have with you? Um, maybe it's Hello Kitty, a different way of experiencing your phone that actually like, you know, um, lets you interact with three-dimensional objects um, in fun and entertaining ways. Maybe you'll have a drone jammer that will keep all those tiny drones from buzzing the tower and so you could just like walk along in peace and read that story on your phone. Maybe you'll have a haptic glove that you carry with you in your pocket. So if you want to interact in a physical way with an, uh, an augmented reality object, you can just play with that right there. Or maybe you have a, um, a smart cup that is doing a good job of just like kind of simplifying your office life, reading all your email, maybe writing back to it, um, you know, checking for Wi-Fi to make sure you're in the right place at the right time and get really good signal, but also serving up a nice hot cup of coffee. Future artifacts. Here's another good lens for thinking about your ideas. And this is one thing that I, I really loved about Twitter, actually. I loved like, this notion of a hashtag. A hashtag was something that if you connected that hashtag, it was like a little bit of glue that would take your post, your idea, that thing that you were thinking about right then, and connect you to an entire community just through that hashtags. Of course, they could be spoofed and used in a lot of like, you know, unfortunate ways. But the interesting thing was like, you could see a hashtag on a sign. You could see a hashtag you know, anywhere on the internet, and you're like, oh, that's connected to something on Twitter. If I put in that hashtag, I'll find out more information about it. Lego blocks. This is another kind of essential thing and like pretty central to the way that like many engineers and designers think. How am I doing on time? It's fine, but you still can't get these. How about that? Okay. Um, you know, the wonderful thing about Lego blocks and the concept of Lego blocks is something that allows every um, part of a product to fit together effortlessly. One thing that will happen within most big tech companies, if different engineering and design teams will go off organically and start recreating their own stuff, often with different code bases, often with different, um, different features and functionality, if only everyone could build in the, using the same sort of structures and the same code base, it's much easier to connect products together, it's much easier to innovate. Hashtags, like hashtags have been around for so long and they've failed three or four times before. And everyone has been like mocked them and said hashtags will never, ever, ever you know, be meaningful. But now hashtags are something that like you walk through the Berkeley campus and I just walked through the Berkeley campus two weeks ago. Everything had a hashtag on it. Literally everything. Everything on those bulletin boards had hashtags. Every store had a hashtag. We ordered Bobo with a hashtag. Hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. It's a moment of, of like really strange little technology that's time has come. It lets you perform an action, find an address, do basically anything with this little visual symbol that requires no technology at all except something to read it. Alan Wrench, you know, can you build systems that have a really simple tool that can build the whole thing? And of course, that's what allowed IKEA to expand radically. And then just add water. I'm fascinated by this because now I do my laundry with a tiny sheet of paper, which is actually a detergent that once I toss it into the laundry, the laundry's water activates that. So I no longer have to go and buy like a 10 pound bottle of detergent at the market. I use a little sheet that a company mails me. That's an example of how, how like adding some little bit of a simple element can transform something. All these companies really sprung up in the pandemic when way more stuff was being mailed. You know, um, so that's an, another little thing. Can you take your product and figure out how it breaks down to a simple, powerful little atom that can be used in many different ways? Another thing, go on an innovation field trip. Uh, I haven't traveled nearly enough. I'm sure everyone in this room may have traveled more. But go to Seoul, go to Bangalore, go to Sao Paulo. Uh, one really fascinating thing happened at Twitter. I had a, uh, my friend Xuan, Xuan Wang went home to Shenzhen in China and she came back. Um, and this was like, gosh, it was like eight years ago. She came back and she said, hashtags are everywhere. People are doing everything on their phone. You know, like no one touches a computer. Um, 
this is the way no one has cash. And I'm like, that sounds really unrealistic. Surely that will never happen in the United States. How many of you have a scrap of cash on you right now? I bet very few. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I might have, a, I have like a $2 bill in my wallet for some weird reason. But, you know, honestly, we use our phones for everything right now. And so, like, what she saw and what she brought back was transformative for our team. So go on trips. Travel while you can um, before you have kids and dogs and mortgages. Um, okay. You'll see, though, when you go to these other countries, like, the, the, like all these, like, fascinating behaviors being much people bringing forms of social innovation, cultural innovation, you know, commercial innovation that will probably seep back here in a couple of years, but you can go get a jump start on it. Next is tri-magical thinking. And so I bring this up um, not just because I'm geeky and I love fantasy stuff, but because like, you know, technology, so much stuff is possible with technology right now and it feels like magic. So a really great way to think about stuff is imagine some common object and what would it be if you added magic to it? Or if you could go, once again, full Harry Potter on that and transform it into something completely different? What if you had magic? What if like, there were no restrictions on what you could do? So what if you took a simple plant and you turned it into a smart plant? A plant that could read air pollution and tell you if air pollution is high. A plant that could tell you if it needs water. A plant that, um, that might be able to communicate with all the other plants on the farm and bring some information about them back to you. What if it could, um, you know, and what if that plant had a magical fairy that was floating along, alongside it. There was actually a little AI that was monitoring that plant. You know, that's a think of, and once again, I keep on, I kept trying to come up with ideas that would be like groundbreaking and it didn't exist right then, but I saw a headline just the other day that they're breeding plants to reflect um, the amount of air pollution and climate change. You know, that, that literally change color based on climate, on different, um, you know, things that are happening in the climate. So between our ability to make new stuff, to code genetics, the, our ability to have AI that can recognize really subtle um, signals or changes in stuff, this magical thinking is something that you can really lean into to help you know, think of new ideas. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but like, you know, a really common way to like, you know, take to spark a little bit of innovation is just mashups, plain old mashups. Take some chocolate, you take some peanut butter, you mash them better together, and they're better than some other parts. Um, so this is like the Reese's pe peanut butter complex. But like basically, like if you had your idea, here's an idea to go back to one thing I mentioned earlier. You had your, like the concept of um, all your household chores, washing dishes, doing laundry, cleaning up stuff, and you wanted to figure out, okay, how has that thing changed if I overlap it with another idea? Like how has that thing changed if I have, for instance, little robots doing it all for me? Or how might all the things that we need to do, here's a good one that just happened. What happens when everyone is stuck in their home but they still need stuff? So living at home, being at home, needing all the stuff, all the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you need food, water, you know, everything you need, and you're in a pandemic and you can't leave your home. So that's circle number two. Circle number two can be something positive or it can be something negative. How does that change circle number one in the core set of ideas that you're, that you're thinking of? And like that middle area where um, working from home, living from home, going to college at home, combines with um, you know, everything that you need to do, that's where some of the innovative ideas come out. Another version of this that I did years ago was working with Staples and helping Staples Im Im imagine like what would happen if you had office products combined with technology. So if any of you are gonna go into design consulting or innovation consulting, it's a really great, very simple, just whip out your Venn diagram, put your current idea on one side, put some big you know, changing element, whether that's complementary or disruptive in the other, and see what happens. Here's another really important thing to play, especially if you are launching a social network. Play the utopia dystopia game. And I misspelled dystopia, and I was an English major at Cal, and I feel awful right now. But pretend that's a Y instead of an I. Dystopia is with a Y. I'll have that changed before you guys download this presentation. Okay. Um, this is where you take your product and you imagine what's the best scenario? What happens if we do everything right? right? If we make the good decisions, if um, our product becomes a force for good and it totally transforms society in a positive way? Think about that. Unfortunately, many people within tech only think about that. They only think about the utopian side. We should connect everyone in the world. They think about the utopia. You also need to think about the dystopia. What happens if people use your product in an unexpected way? What happens if you make some decisions 
that actually ends up hurting a lot of people. Or, um, or there's unexpected network effects when, when people begin using your product in ways that, um, you, that you did not expect. And that will always happen. And every tech company that I've ever been at, that happens. There's piracy, there's people who use fake identities, there's people who look at every platform that gets launched and they go like, how could I exploit that? So one crucial thing that you need to do, whatever product you build, is make sure that you are biasing that technology for good. You can never say we are a neutral platform, technology is great, it's totally neutral. Instead, you, if you do not bias your product or platform or technology for good, um, unexpected, really disturbing things are bound to happen. And I work at Adobe. You know, we, uh, we realize that Photoshop can be, can be used to do some very unexpected things, and so we work hard at putting the safeguards within our system to prevent that. We work hard at making sure that we base like, authenticity things into images that will say, is this image real? Is this image fake? You have to build those safeguards and that thinking into the things you create. And lastly, this is the most important thing. When you're designing the future, you need to help people adapt. That will be your little brother, that will be your grandmother, that will be the people who don't have the same access to technology that you do. You have to think about how can we meaningfully help all these people adapt to the future? And one approach is like, okay, like let's just, let's just you know, lay as much technology on as possible. We did, you know, if we have something really cool, we have some blockchains and NFTs, surely grandma wants to invest in blockchains and get some NFTs. Surely they need like the most fanciest cell phone they can have out there. Surely my nana needs to you know, have as much technology as possible in her life. That is like some people's initial instinct of let's just layer on the technology as much as we can. But what you really should do and what you really need to think about is like, wait a minute. How can we bring the future down to earth? How can we bring the future closer to humans? How can we bring the future, you know, make it something that, is, that feels human, that feels accessible, that feels inclusive, that feels fair, that feels clear. So maybe rather than, you know, cyber nana, maybe what we really want to do is like have a future compatible nana who can, you know, have a cup of coffee that helps her remember to take, do her yoga, that has a flower that remembers it, that tells her like, hey, it's sunny outside, maybe a good time for a walk. You want to bring technology and innovation down to a human scale. There's a little framework in here that, um, that I'll leave you with, and you guys, I'm not going to read through everything on here. I'm only, only going to read through one side of it. But you guys can get the presentation and look at the whole thing, and I'll show you where in just a moment. But instead of, I am going to read it all. Instead of benefiting the few, benefit the many. Instead of unlocking vast wealth, unlock human potential. Instead of consuming immense resources, to, by the way, to train ChatGPT, they like drained this aquifer in Iowa. You know, yikes. Um, so that we could all write our papers. Okay, grow sustainably. Instead of building new walls and silos, make the world feel more open. Instead of making tech feel more complex, make tech feel clear. Instead of controlling innovation, democratize innovation. And instead of making the future feel alien, make the future feel human. Thank you. That's awesome. Uh, Matt, I, I feel like if we only had this lecture this semester, it would have been fantastic. I know there's a whole club back there in the back. Feel free to come on down if you want to come over here. Um, and so we have about a good 25 minutes. I don't even want to put my slide up. Where would you like to sit? You, you sit that side. Fantastic. Oh, and by uh, the way, I'm sorry. That's where you can download this, but I am going to fix that typo because I have OCD and it's totally nagging me. But you can get this whole um, presentation right there. The dystopia typo? Yeah, the dystopia oh. typo. OK. Um, welcome, everybody. Come on down. Uh, like I said, we have about 25 minutes, and I have a feeling there are a lot of questions. Um, I would rather have you all ask questions. I certainly have some. Um, but uh, Sukriti and Amy are here, so as soon as you raise your hand, let us know. One second. You have your moleskin. I got to get my security blanket, but I can't find it. But yeah. okay. I just want to have our matching notebooks. Okay, well, yeah. We mm -hmm. Right there. Lucas, uh, introduce yourself and... Hello, uh, my name is Lucas. I'm a sophomore. I'm also a CogSci major. Uh, I actually found a connection with last week's speaker, uh, Mr. Zach Cass, and he talked about being an AI optimist, but I found your take on uh, kind of like uh, 
innovation very interesting where there's like the utopian and dystopian view. So I want to say, I wanted to ask like, if you're still an optimist despite the possibility of the dystopian view and kind of what your view on this whole boom of AI is, whether it's like the good outweighs the bad. I would say I'm more of an AI realist. I think okay. that, that we, um, we can't just be optimists. We have to think about, you know, what could go wrong and work really closely with other humans and with AI to ensure that it goes in the right direction. And it's directly, so I run an, a drawing app uh, at Adobe and, um, and one of the groups of people that are directly affected by this are artists and illustrators who are looking at something like Midjourney that can create really powerful, effective art and they're looking and it presents an existential crisis to them. But I don't think we can ignore it. I think we have to figure out ways to, one, make sure that we guide and shape AI, and I'm glad for all the organizations that are doing that. But then we also figure out, have to figure out how to help people survive and thrive in the age of AI. So I'm more, I'm more balanced, but I am not, I'm not an optimist. I just know that it's here, and we have to figure out meaningful ways to work with it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, how do you create an environment that invites people to be creative? It takes space and time. And that's one of my favorite things to do is to create workshops or events that give people a little bit of a time away from their daily roadmap or their daily work to, um, to think creatively. And the way you do it is often it's great if you can take them away from um, where they're at. Oh, by the way, this is like a, an amazing campus. There's so many beautiful places here that are like nice environments for, for thinking and, and sort of having that moment of calm. But you have to create a safe space. And the safe space um, means that you have somewhere where they could think really broadly, where everyone has a, the opportunity to express themselves. So sometimes when I run a workshop, I usually come up with many different ways for people to express their ideas in that. Some things where people are speaking, some things where people are writing, because often, and you probably have noticed it, like. If you don't create multiple ways for people to share their ideas, the loudest voice always wins in a room. So I always look at how do I create a, a really equitable way for people to contribute ideas to a conversation. And then the other thing about it is you have to like completely put the distractions of the day aside. So just like you might have had in um, high school, it's like you put your phones in a, in a bucket. <laughs> you gotta like, you gotta take all those signals and all those buzz uh, away from people so they have a chance to think about something new and differently. The other thing that often really helps is bring some, um, why I really love working with research is bringing human insights to the table. And, or, or what I mean by that, you either want to connect people to their customers in unique ways, get people out of the office where they can experience and work directly with the people who they're designing for. You have to find ways to create that more human connection so that product strategy isn't being shaped in the abstract. Got it. Thank you. Hey, sorry. I'm still stuck on what you said about ChatGPT and the Iowa aquifer. Could you expand on that? Yeah, that was, a, that was a remarkable headline. So, you know, um, I am not a fan of blockchain or NFTs. Like, why are we creating these you know, strange arcane objects for a very select group of people that, are, um, that use so much computing power just to handle the, the blockchain? But yeah, it was, a, it was a rip from the headlines thing that I saw just about a week ago. And it was talking about like, how much water um, was needed in that small Iowa town to keep the servers cool while they were doing the amount of machine learning necessary necessary to, to bring us the latest version of ChatGPT. Can that be done in a way that doesn't, um, and suddenly that small Iowa town is rethinking its relationship with, um, with Microsoft at that point. Thank you, Matthew, uh, for this presentation. Uh, it's been just great seeing your work and your beautiful art. Um, I'm just curious because you did talk about learning design. Is it something that we learn? And if it is, how do we learn how to be better designers? Um, and if it's not something that you learn, what are ways so that you can uh, enhance your creativity and hopefully bring some uh, products into the world? Um, I think one of the most important aspects of design is understanding the person who you're designing for. That's probably one of the most crucial things. It, It doesn't matter, you can design without drawing, you can design without being able to <laughs> manipulate images, you can design without, um, you can design stuff without kind of the, the visual side of things. The most important thing is having a deep understanding of who you're designing for and being able to envision or, or conceive of ideas that would be meaningful for that person. 
And then the nice thing is like you can collaborate and work with different people to um, provide those skills of like, you know, there are some people who are very strong visual designers. There are some people who are excellent at thinking of systems and systems architecture. Um, there's many different ways to design things. And some of my favorite product managers and engineers are able to um, use creativity to think about their, their core tasks in new ways. But um, the nice thing now, and, and one thing that uh, I didn't mention it in the talk, I'm also working with um, the ability to like learn design is more democratized now than it's ever been. And I'm working with the California Department of Education to see how we can spread that even further. Our goal, uh, what I'm doing in that work is trying to look at how we can bring design education down into California public high schools and community colleges. Because um, design shouldn't be something that you have to go to an expensive art school for. It should be something that anyone can learn and anyone can do. And it actually is something that, that anyone can begin picking up and learning. Hi. Um, so I have a question about like AI art um, because I really like drawing and recently I've been seeing a lot of AI art and it's really amazing what um, it can create but I was wondering what your stance is on it and whether you think that it would replace like traditional artists or where the relationship between AI art and traditional artists will go. Um, I would say that, that AI art is certainly it's really profound, and there are some very inspiring and pretty amazing things that are, that are being created by, by AI right now. And my advice or the path that I see for, um, as I'm thinking about designers and illustrators and artists, is that they will need to um, look at those skills that will help them to kind of keep moving forward in a universe where there will definitely be more AI coming along. I think the metaphor that I try and think of is like, if you're a designer or an artist or an illustrator, you need to transition from just playing one instrument to being more like a composer, where you are able to you know, pull together what many different instruments can do and, and have them sort of work on your behalf. So I think like uh, art and illustration will definitely change. In some ways, it's democratizing, and more people are going to have the opportunity to um, storytell and create really powerful visuals. I think for artists and illustrators, and I'm, this is like directly connected to my, myself and my job, the work I do, um, they're going to have to find ways that they can take advantage of it, use it, um, almost use it like choreograph, uh, like, like a choreographer choreographs dancers, a composer choreographs different instruments. I think artists are going to need to figure out how to um, work in new ways to be able to take advantage of it instead of, um, being taken advantage of by it. And I, I think about this all the time. <laughs> but I think the one thing, actually, I just want to go back to, you mentioned to the previous question about design really quickly. Everyone here, draw every day. And it doesn't have to be pretty, and it doesn't have to be representational, and you don't need to draw what an owl looks like or what a horse looks like. I would recommend that everyone in here doodle as much as possible, because it helps you visualize stuff. And the quickest path to being a good designer <laughs> is to like, and visualize stuff, it doesn't mean that I'm, like, I'm visualizing a Rembrandt painting. It means you start visualizing how a system works together, or how two objects might interact, or draw stick figures. Just draw all the time. Sorry, that's my big draw push. Hi, Matthew. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sejo. I'm a senior uh, studying economics and business. You mentioned earlier in your presentation that you went through multiple career pivots throughout your journey. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk about some factors that helped you make those pivots. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you uh, say some factors that help you make? Make those pivots, those career pivots. pivots? Oh, yeah. career pivots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, some of them were strictly economic. Like, you know, one thing that happened when um, after the... I've done, here's one thing that I did really well. For some reason, I had a sixth sense that told me that the company that I was working at was going to either go out of business or be acquired. And I jumped a lot. In my, the first part of my career, I was like, I was changing jobs like every year and a half, every two years at a pretty quick clip because there was so much change going on in San Francisco at the time. And I think what I always wanted to do was like, you know, work on authentic experiences that were really meaningful to me. So at the moment that that felt like I was stepping away from that or the companies that I was working at were changing, um, I jumped. I also, like, in the, another reason, you know, there's a dot com boom followed immediately, which was like San Francisco was just chock full of hype. Like, and there were like people treated dot coms like they were major um, motion picture launches. And um, a lot of it just was not real. <laughs> um, but 
economics was a big driver there. The company that I was working at like, um, was laying people off, um, was, had like, not good outcomes ahead. The dot-com thing was winding down. I jumped and started my little three-person design studio and did that for as long as possible. And then I, after that, when um, we had to close that business down, I went to go work at an industrial design company because for whatever reason, all the interactive stuff in San Francisco was, was winding down for a little while. And everyone either went to go work at tech companies down in the South Bay or um, me and a couple of friends went and worked for product design companies that were building physical products. So even though the internet was like taking a little bit of a pause, um, people still liked to buy stuff. So it was really fascinating to go work at industrial design companies and learn about physical product strategy and work with researchers and, um, and traditional product strategists in a new way. I guess I've always, oh, yeah, I, I think the short answer is I've always really ch um, chased learning. And it, when it feels like I'm not learning something new, that's usually when I jump. But I plan on staying at Adobe for a really long time because I've been learning stuff new ever since I've been there. Matthew, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm super curious, like you briefly mentioned about how it's important for everyone to have like access to creative tools and like just having a palette for that. And I've been like a long time Adobe user since like the CS6 days. And like over time I've noticed like Adobe's been like, you know, moving from a fixed price to a subscription price. And like I was wondering how that kind of goes with Adobe's goal of increasing access to creative tools. Well, some of the tools, I think we're looking at a broad portfolio. And luckily, the things that I work on are actually free. So the drawing tool Fresco is free. Express is free. Um, these are things that are, and my goal there is like, it's a big company. If we're going to deliver on creativity for all, to, to me, that means it has to be free. It has to be accessible. It has to be simple and easy to use. So the products that like Adobe is working on a broad, has a broad portfolio, but there are, um, you can do amazing things in Adobe Express. You can design, you know, almost anything that you might be able to do with some of our more powerful, powerful products. And, um, and we've also really focused on, you know, there's some products at Adobe that are really focused on Creative Pros. There are some products at Adobe that are focused on kind of a broader range of users. Another really fascinating thing that, I've, that has been at Adobe that I, that I never expected, but it's really exciting, is almost all the major apps are, um, have some version of themselves on the web. And this is a massive transition. Like this, this journey began probably three years ago when um, the chief product officer, Scott Belsky, you know, put out the challenge, like what if we could reimagine what Adobe is? Um, what if we imagined a version of Adobe that is more focused on web and mobile? And that is the path that we're taking right now. Uh, as we start having different versions of Adobe products, I think there is that central goal. Of how can we make meaningful products as free and accessible as possible to the broadest range of people, even while we still continue to have our, our professional tools? Um, yeah, I'm on, I'm on the side of like, how can we get our products into as many hands as possible, especially when I'm thinking about students. Hi, Matthew. I'm Vanessa. Um, thanks so much for coming today. So one thing you mentioned that kind of stood out to me was how, like you said, in around like one to two years, we're going to be moving into a world where we're just going to be like managing these AI agents to help us kind of live. Yeah. And I totally see that happening. But it's also kind of scary just because, like you mentioned, oh, let's make sure you draw every day. Like I feel like just doing things hands-on is becoming so foreign to our generation. Like everything is just technology and there's just like less and less human connection. And I see the like negative effects every, like all the time, like how it's deteriorating our mental health sometimes. So I just like wonder, like you said to build a future that feels more human. Like how, how are we supposed to design that future with the rise in AI and like this increasing use of technology and the lack of human connection? Like, how, how do you see us doing that? I think you're going to have to balance it even more with interacting with the physical world, physical objects, and doing stuff where you, you know, completely shed away your technology and you focus on the things that are tactile, human, um, calming, you know, that really activate the parts of your brain that tell stories, activate the parts of your brain that plays with visual relationships. You're going to have to get even more crafty than ever. And one little stat I, I saw the other day is like, Weirdly enough, Pinterest is making a huge comeback um, because the um, Gen Z and kind of that younger age like want to have more tactile things and are looking for more craft projects to do, probably to get away from consuming TikTok nonstop. And don't get me wrong, TikTok is entertaining as heck, but it, I don't feel fulfilled, inspired, or um, 
And it reduces creativity too, because you have no space to think. It's just consuming. It's just consuming content. You're just stimulated 24 seven. Totally. So, you know, I, th I think like the way to balance the, r the rise of AI or the way to make sure that the ways that we interact with AI and the, the content or stories or products that we create through AI, the way to make sure that that remains human and human feeling is by embracing all the kind of like the pre-tech, non-tech side of your lives. Thank you. Someone have the mic? Hot diggity. OK, now I get to ask you some questions. Yeah. So um, I just want to remind you all that at the beginning of the semester, our theme was the basics of starting new businesses uh, and starting new ventures. And I just want, with a show of hands, how many of you either have, are, or are thinking about starting a new venture? Just with a show of hands. Really high. Of that number. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome. How many of you, but keep your hands up, keep your hands up. How many of you are working with a designer, a product designer? All right, so this gets to my question. When should someone, when they're thinking about a new business, bring in a product designer? And when have you been brought into new startups? Or startups, sorry, it's redundant. Um, I've been brought, up, brought in at really early stages. So I'll tell you a, a really valuable thing that a designer can do uh, at a very early stage is help you to think about the different experiences that you need to articulate or illustrate, to think about like, you know, an early stage prototype that you might need to craft. Um, to think about like how do they like you guys saw that coffee maker sketch that I had earlier. Oh, hold on, I'm just gonna jump back to that. So I've worked. Oh, I can't. Okay. Um, Here, I'll do it. You can talk. I'll do it. Okay. A lot of times, what I've done for friends and early stage companies is um, is help to develop kind of like design fiction or an early stage prototype or something that is, if you go there, it's that coffee mug. Yeah, I saw it in just a second. There are a lot of slides in here. I'm so sorry, she told Am me Am I that. past it? Oh, you find it. You're much better at this okay. time. But um, I've, I've often been brought in to do very early stage branding, but the most important thing is an early stage sort of sketched out prototype that looks kind of real, but isn't real. That, that they then take to investors to, um, to bring their idea around and say, like, here's what we're thinking of. And usually it's just creating just enough design within that, that um, say, for instance, if we're trying to like, sell a super fancy coffee maker, it might be coming up with a physical prototype. If we were selling something like, I did a, um, another, another Berkeley grad, and a guy named Mike Mazur, uh, who I um, have known forever and one of my oldest friends, created an app called Fitstar, which was like a fitness app on the iPad that then he sold to Fitbit right as Fitbit sold to Google. But what we started with was just coming up with a range of screens that made it look real and that it could bring an iPad with these screens that looked like real UI but weren't hooked up, bring that to the pitches, and it could say, here's what it would feel like. So a designer can help you take that big, bold idea or that technology and um, sketch out you know, what it might feel like. And here's another crazy thing. You could also, there's a lot of design that you can do on your own. You can probably learn enough to, um, to think about what would be a, a, that meaningful prototype to just get started with. And, and one thing I also do at the very early stages of every project, look at competitive, um, either direct competitors or indirect competitors. Study their experience, study their UI. Um, if you're creating something that doesn't exist and has no competitors, study things that feel roughly analogous to that. And, and you know, do a lot of, make a mood board. <laughs> That's another thing. Get a physical mood board or put a mirror, mood board on Miro and start saying, it might feel kind of like this. When, so you have worked at Twitter, you've worked at Facebook, you're now at Adobe and a lot of other um, companies before that. Um, in those companies, can you point to any examples of where your work um, changed things for the better or for the worse? Just kind of curious if you have any stories of success or failures that you could share. Yeah, uh, I, I can share. So one thing that I did that was successful at Facebook was um, they had five different products for advertising with. Each product had different UI, different code base. They all, every product manager thought that their product was only used by their little narrow slice of customers. And nothing worked 
together. And what they didn't, what they didn't realize, all the product managers at the, at the moment, they didn't realize that like, they got some research back that said that actually all of the ads customers at Facebook were using all the products. So all of them were experiencing the dysfunction, experiencing the different UI, experiencing that things were built on different code bases or didn't work together. And that, that object model thing, although that was not the most shiny object in my portfolio, that um, created a, a central object model that allowed all of the different ad products to work together that made it function more smoothly. So um, did it save the world? No. Did it say, did it help their ads products actually work together? Yeah, that was good. Um, one final question before I put up our, our code also for feedback. Um, you were talking about different ways of getting inspiration. For you, Matt Carlson, where do you go to get visual inspiration? Uh, I go to, I go outside. I go on long walks and I look at a lot of nature. I also um, go to really great bookstores <laughs> and I love looking at book covers and books and design books. And I also, uh, and I have a, a deep love for Pinterest. So those three things. Um, you know, I look at, yeah, bookstores, comic book shops, um, walking in nature and just thinking and, you know, looking at the world around me. Um, I also really love cities and walking mm. through cities. Oh, the, here's the, the great thing about cities. You know, you go to San Francisco or New York or London or Barcelona or any city, you see the way that, like, that the communities have sort of shaped that city around you. So there's lots of visual ephemera, um, lots of things that, that show how humans inhabit a place that can be totally inspiring. Yeah, I can only imagine it must be incredibly fun to go with you to places and see things through your eyes. Thank you for allowing us to see some things through your eyes and also inspiring us. It's been great. Um, while, while I'm fiddling around with technology to get the, the passcode up, feel free to come up and ask Matt some questions, uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here, by the way. This has been a dream coming and sharing stories with all of you.